So we want to get into our study this morning. We are doing the book of Ruth, and uh, you have handouts there, so I'm not going to uh, have you turn in your scriptures. You can just look at those handouts. Uh, today is, is actually part two. Um, how, many here, how many were not here last week? You missed last week. Leave. No, I'm just kidding you. Listen, um, uh, don't, don't feel bad about that at all. You can go to New Life Raymond on the website and you can uh, upload and you can watch the uh, DVD. You can see the whole thing and, or you can just listen to the audio if you'd like. But why go audio when, you know, when you can get this in there? So um, anyways, we want you to be right abreast. All of these things are going to be archived. And if you miss any of them, hey, don't worry about it. You can go, you can go and make it up. So we're talking, about, we're talking about Ruth, and I am, I am going to do a quick uh, snapshot of last week, what we talked about last week. And, um, and so this is the land of Israel after the tribes had settled. So you can see the different tribes. You know, here's Asher, and Naphtali, and Issachar, and um, Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Judah, and all these different tribes. Here's Bethlehem of Judah located right there. And we saw that in Bethlehem last week, uh, in the times of the judges, which is going back about uh, 3,000 years or so, uh, that there was a man by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. They had two sons, Malhon and Chelion, and uh, a famine had hit this region, and so they left Bethlehem and traveled around down into Moab right here. And last week we saw that Elimelech's name means God is my king. And so we asked the question, why would somebody whose name is God is my king travel to a pagan area where the God that was worshipped was named Chemosh and who demanded human sacrifice? You know, why would, why would they do that? Why would they leave the covenantal land of promise uh, where God said he would set his face towards and go into a pagan land? And, um, and so anyways, when they get there, um, Elimelech dies and the two sons marry Moabitish women. And so one marries a girl by the name of Orpah, the other one marries a girl by the name of Ruth, and then those two boys die. And uh, the whole scenario, uh, finally, Naomi says, I'm going, to, I'm going to leave Moab and I'm going back home. And um, the daughter-in-law, she says, you know, just go back to your own country. You've got a better chance of getting married. And, uh, but Ruth says, no, Ruth says, I'm going to cling to you. Uh, your people will be my people. Your land will be my land. I'll never forsake you. As a matter of fact, your God will be my God. And where you're buried, I'll be buried too. I'm burning the ships on the beach. I'm not going back. I'm going to stand with you through thick and thin. And so that's where we left off on chapter 1, where they leave the land of Moab and start going back to Bethlehem, and, uh, and, and when, they, you know, when they get back to Bethlehem, um, people, you know, these are small farming communities, and these are all extended families, so everybody knows everybody, and when, when they come back, everyone is like, this is Naomi, and she says, no, no, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, call me Mara, which means bitter. And she says, because the hand of God has gone out against me, and God has dealt with me bitterly. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but um, sometimes people get into that, uh, woe is me. And, you know, actually, you know, life is tragic, isn't it? Uh, life has some sharp turns, and life can be tragic, life can be difficult, can be hard at times. But through it all, we have to remember that God has a plan. God is sovereign, God is good, and God is working out his plan even in your life. You're like, well, I'm not a biblical character. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are recorded in God's books, and you most certainly are. And so now the famine is lifted. Ruth and uh, her mother-in-law, Naomi, return back home, and, and Naomi has picked up this incredibly loyal companion in Ruth, and they get home, and now we shift over to chapter 2, and you have your green handout, and I want you to just look at verse 1. It says, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So Boaz, the name, means fleetness or quickness. And we're going to see where he lives up to his name, that Boaz moves fairly quickly in, uh, in this relationship, and we're going to see this unfold. And so, you know, here's the thing. Elimelech and Naomi, they made a choice to leave when times get tough. 
And sometimes we bail too early. We quit school before graduating. We leave jobs before pushing through. We leave relationships. We leave marriages. We just quit too early. We leave a church because the pastor didn't wave at me. Hey, look, I'm waving at all of you right now, okay? So don't let that be a reason, you know. You have, you know before, if you feel like I, I jilted you or something, you know, just give me a call before you leave, and, um, and, and I'll say, good, there's the door. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We love, we love everybody. You know, here's the deal. We find out that when Naomi returns to Bethlehem, nobody died. Nobody perished in the famine. It was a tough time, but it wasn't like a, a plague. It wasn't like people were dropping like flies. Everyone's still there. And as a matter of fact, people are starting to really prosper. And we see that with Elimelech. Elimelech is really prospering. You know, here's the deal. Sometimes we justify bad choices in our life because of difficult circumstances. We get into a difficult circumstance, we compromise, we make a bad choice, and then we try to justify it. And uh, we can't do that. We shouldn't do that. And it says that Elimelech was a man of great wealth. And the, the verbiage there in the Hebrew is exactly the same as a man of valor or a man of God. He is definitely a man of God, as we're going to see. And we find out that he's a kinsman. Now, this is the theme of the book of Ruth the kinsman redeemer. And we're going to see this unfold as we go through the next couple of chapters. But the Hebrew word is the word goel, G-O-E-L. A goel is a relative, usually a brother, to a deceased man who is the kinsman and actually is called a kinsman redeemer. And we're going to see how that all plays out. And I want you to see what kind of man that Boaz is. Just drop down to verse 4. Uh, Boaz comes to his fields and the servants are working. And it says, now Boaz came from Bethlehem and he said to the reapers, may the Lord be with you. And they said to him, and may God, may the Lord bless you as well. And so this is a typical greeting that people would greet one another in the streets of Israel, Um, but it normally wasn't a greeting that you would greet servants with. This is a greeting that you would greet friends with. As a matter of fact, so much so that the psalmist talked about a time in Israel when that they were so far from God that they had lost this greeting. So there's Boaz means fleetness, but here's the greeting. In Psalms 129, it says, nor do those who pass by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you, we bless bless you in the name of the Lord. So he's talking about a time that was so bad that people wouldn't even greet one another with this blessing. But this necessarily wasn't a blessing that you would just servants, you know, basically uh, indentured slaves that were working the fields. And um, they might have been people who had gone into poverty and now they're, they're just helping out and these reapers are working in those fields. And so look at verses two and three, and it says, and Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go into the fields and gleam among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might find favor. And she said, Go, my daughter. And she departed and went and gleamed in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come into the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And so now we start seeing more about Ruth. The name Ruth means beauty. Ruth is a babe. I mean, they even name a candy bar after her. (laughs) All right. We won't even go there. I I didn't say any names. Um, And so Ruth, Ruth, you know, I want you to see the humility. Ruth Ruth is so in love with Naomi, for whatever reason, her mother-in-law, that she's like, you know what, I want to provide for you. And she asked permission, please. You know, it wasn't like Naomi was saying, hey, get your keister over there and make a living. She's like, no, she's the one that's asking. She's like, hey, let me, please let me go into the fields. Let me get some substance. Let me help us survive. Let me do some work. And now this was a custom that we find in Israel in Leviticus 19 verses 9 and 10, it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of the harvest. Verse 10, um, nor shall you glean uh, the vineyard, nor shall you glean the fallen fruit of your vineyard, nor you shall leave them for the needy and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. And so God is saying basically, 
you, you know, you've got a field and it's bordered out, and when you're gleaning, when you're going through and harvesting, don't go right into that 90-degree little corner and get everything. Just kind of cut corners. This is where we get the saying, hey, you're cutting corners. Because like in American agriculture, you wouldn't cut corners. You would make sure you gleaned everything. But God said, no, I want you to cut corners. I want you to leave some produce behind so that the poor can keep their dignity, and it's like a welfare program. Farmers were commanded to be generous so that the poor could go in and have the dignity of self-work and still be able to make a living, still be able to have sustenance, still be able to take care of their needs. And so it was a law in Israel, and sometimes they would even leave some behind as they were harvesting, and it was like a social assistance program. It was God's way of saying, listen, be generous, but also let the poor come in and let them help themselves to some of the things that's going on here. And so, and it's interesting because in these verses it says that, that Ruth happens to go into Boaz's field. And we know that that doesn't happen just by accident. We know that this is the supernatural hand of God guiding her and moving her because God is moving in everybody's lives. If you remember the story of Esther, There was a time in Esther where there was this plot to destroy the Jews, and the king one night couldn't sleep, and he said, bring me the records of the the happenings in the province and in the kingdom so that I can read this boring stuff and hopefully fall asleep. And the Bible says, and it just so happens that the servant read about something that Mordecai had done in favor of the king. And the king was like, well, what has been done for this man to reward him and to honor him? And this whole turning happens supernaturally, sovereignly, because it's like, well, wasn't that a coincidence? Listen, there are no coincidences with God. God moves sovereignly. God moves supernaturally in your lives. Right now, God is moving in your life. You, say, you might say, well, I don't feel like it, but he is. And sometimes God moves slowly. God doesn't move on our timeline But he moves slowly, but he's definitely moving in your lives. You know, years ago, hook rugs were were craved. Like everybody, all the ladies would make hook rugs. And if you looked at one side of the hook rug, it looked like Walt Disney threw up in Technicolor, right? It was just like all these colors and these strings hanging out and knots, and it was like just ridiculous looking. But when you flipped it around, it was a beautiful picture. You know, it might have been a farm scene or something like that. And that's kind of like our lives. Right now, we see the mixed up colors. We see the loose threads. We see the big knots. We don't make sense sometimes of the things that's going on. But one day, God's going to flip it around, and we're going to see the loving, sovereign hand of God supernaturally working through every event in our lives. That He had never left us alone. That He was always busy and working in our lives, in your life, and in my life. So it goes on into verse 7. It says, Now, behold, Boaz came to Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said, May the Lord bless you. Verse 5, Then Boaz said to his servants in charge of the reaper, Whose young woman is this? And the servant in charge of the reaper said, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean And gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came, and she has remained from morning until now, and she's been sitting in the house a little while. So the house would have been a tent, very, very, very hot. So around noontime, people would retreat under the shade of a tent and, uh, and then go back out in the fields after a little bit of a siesta. And, uh, and look what he says. He says, she came in the morning, and she's been gleaning until now. Here's the thing. This servant was the head of all of the harvesters. A lot of times women or indentured slaves. And it was this guy's job to make sure that the harvesters were harvesting properly, that they were doing a good job. And yet this guy is so on the ball, he knows everything that's going on. Because they wouldn't really pay attention to the poor that were just coming in and picking up the scraps after them. But this guy knows everything that's going on. He knows who Ruth is, where she's come from, the mother-in-law, the whole thing, how long she's been there. This guy is on the ball. This is the kind of guy you want to hire. This guy, And here's the deal. Someone is always watching you. Your children? Ouch. You know, I mean, there was a time in Tim's life when I started seeing Darlene come out in him, and I was like, oh my goodness, that was horrible. Just just kidding, you know, the the nut don't fall far from the tree, and that's sometimes not a good thing. 
and uh, somebody's always watching you, co-workers, your kids, or somebody's always watching you. And, and, and he goes to this guy and he says, hey, who's this, who's this young woman? And he's like, you know, she's a foreigner, she's from Moab, and he knows all about her. And, and what he tells Boaz really strikes Boaz. It makes a really good impression on Boaz because this lady is there and she's working hard. And he hears, he hears a couple of things. Number one, he hears about her love. He hears about the fact that she loves her mother-in-law, who's a Jewish lady, so much that she asked to come in the fields to reap and provide for her. He hears about her humility, that she takes the initiative. She just doesn't come and say, hey, we're poor, we're dying, somebody's got to help us here. Give me a handout. Come on, I'm voting for Bernie. Give me something for free. She doesn't do that. She's like, I'm, gonna, I'm here. So he hears about this humility that she takes the initiative and she doesn't demand. And she, he hears about her work ethic, that she's there from sun up, and now it's noontime, but if you drop down into verse 17, you see where she worked all the way till sunset. She worked from sun up till sunset in that arid heat, in that dry desert condition from morning to evening, and she worked hard. She's got a great work ethic. Listen, let me tell you something. Nothing trumps work ethic. Nothing. If you want to get ahead in life, quit your belly aching and complaining and work. Amen. Work hard. You know, I got, when I came out of high school, I got into jobs and, and into, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing and production, and I worked hard. I made sure I was there early. I made sure I was at my workstation and got it ready so that when the clock struck working time, while other guys were coming and getting their stations ready, I was already producing. I made sure that I came back from breaks a couple minutes early just to get things ready to go again. I stayed late if it need be. I just worked really, really hard. And guess what? I got promoted to foreman within, within about a year's time. I was a foreman of an entire department. It wasn't because I was the smartest, because there were guys there with college educations. And I barely made it through high school. It wasn't because I was older, because I was only 18, and there were guys in their mid-30s that were working there. Nothing trumps a work ethic, not education, not anything. And so if you want to get ahead in life, listen, just work and work hard. You got to pay your dues. You know, young, it seems like young people nowadays want to come out of high school, do almost nothing and get jobs making $45 an hour. Ain't going to happen. You got to pay your dues. You got to work hard. Well, I want $15 an hour to flip burgers at McDonald's. Minimum wage should be, listen, those jobs aren't careers. Those jobs are for high school kids. Don't sit there and work at McDonald's and think you're going to demand you're going to make enough to make a career out of it. If you don't like working at McDonald's, get a better job. Get an education. Work hard. There's no second to working hard. When Darlene and I was dating, I was working a full 40-hour-a-week uh, job. I went out and got a second job. I was working for the post office, painting their mailboxes and making the concrete things that they were bolted down to. I was getting up early in the morning and doing Berean classes so that I could get licensed with the AG. Work hard. We got a great... I love my staff. We got a great work ethic here. We work hard. Some, sometimes people come around like, you know, you're a workaholic. Absolutely. I like working. See, the problem with a lot of people is like, well, work isn't good. No, work is good. No, Saturday's good. No, work is good. God created us to be creative. God created us to work. Okay, well, anyways, I don't know who that was for, but we got off on a little bit there. A great work ethic is good. So look at verse 8. It says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Let your eye be on the fields which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. And so now all of a sudden, Boaz starts speaking very kindly to this woman. There's something about her work ethic, her humility, her love that's an attraction and, and, and so he says, listen, stay in my fields. He's providing her food. He's going to provide her food. He's like, don't, you know, don't go around like a hobo. Stay right here. You've got a job. You've got a place here. Just gleam after my servants. And then he says, I'm going to give you companionship too. Hang out with my maidens. 
And you'll build some relationships. You know, you're all young girls, and, and, and you'll make some connections. And then he provides protections. He says, I've commanded the young men or the servants not to touch you because she was a foreigner. Now, if something happened between a Jew and a Jew, then it was marriage. Dun, 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 dun. You know what I'm saying? But a foreigner, things could have gone bad really quickly, and yet he commands them, don't touch this girl, or I'll bust your face. And so he gives this commandment, and then he provides refreshment, and he says, listen, if you're thirsty, go to the watering pots where my maidens go, where my workers go. Go, because water is like, you know, huge, especially here, you got to stay hydrated, and, uh, you know, just go, and all these things. Now, now, up to this point, there's no romantic attraction going on here. Boaz is just a godly man. He sees this woman in need. He's impressed with the fact that this woman loves her mother-in-law so much that she's doing everything to provide for her in her old age. And so he's just reciprocating to that. He's responding to that. He's just you know, giving her really good uh, a, a, a leg up in life and helping her out really, really well. And, and let's face it, she's just worked in the field from sunup till sundown. Probably not like the most attractive thing. You know, probably like, whoa, you know, hey, stand back there, Ruth, let me talk to you from a distance, or let me get upwind of you or something, you know. So, so, but he extends this kindness to her outside of a romantic relationship. Look at verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and she said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice on me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz replied to her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has fully been reported to me, and how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, whose wings you have come to seek refuge." Now, you know, you just want to highlight that part right there because we're going to come back to that in chapters 3. This whole idea about the wings in whom you've taken refuge under. And so um, Ruth is now thanking Boaz for his kindness, and she's saying, you know, why have I found favor in your sight? Which is, you know, which is a lot nicer than saying, well, it's about time somebody noticed how much I'm working over here. I'm killing myself. I'm slaving like a dog. I've been working hard all day, blah, blah. Somebody should, she doesn't do that. She never mentions that, but he notices that. A total significant difference in attitude between Naomi, oh, everything's going bad in my life, God's turned against me, boo-hoo-hoo, and Ruth, who never brings up this stuff. She never complains about the hard things that have come into her life because she's had a pretty hard life up to this point. And she says, seeing I'm a, I'm a foreigner, that never left. That was always in the forefront of her mind. That was always constantly on Ruth's mind that I'm a foreigner here. I'm a Moabitess girl in Israel. It's a very difficult situation. And Boaz reaches out to her and welcomes her, brings her in. Now listen, our society structure has changed greatly over the years. You know, I, I mean, it's no longer Walton's Mountain anymore, is it? You know, as a matter of fact, people usually don't have a lot of family because everybody is so transient, everybody moves around so much. Sociologists call what's happening tribalization because people are moving, and what they're doing is they don't have family units, they have friend units. And so they move into like these peer groupings, and sociologists call this tribalization. And just as Boaz was willing to you reach out into somebody's different and welcome her because she was, you know, seeking God. We need to do the same thing. We need to be able to welcome people outside of our tribe or our worldview. We need to be able to welcome them, especially if they're seeking the things of God. This is a great, you know, this is just a great teaching on evangelization. I mean, we talk a, a sermon right here on evangelism. But look at this. Ruth says, why have I found favor? This is the question that sometimes we should ask too. Like, God, why do we find favor as Christians? Out of all the world, why have you saved us? That's what she asks in verse 10. And the answer comes in verse 12, because she sought refuge under the wings of God. 
Because something happened in your life, and at some point in your life, you started seeking refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. Look what, um, look what the psalmist says in Psalms 36, 7. How precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings. And then another one in Psalms 57. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in me and in, in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. So this concept of coming under. Remember Jesus said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how did I long to take you under my wings as a hen would take her brood? And this is the whole saying that God wants to cover, be a protector, be a refuge, be a shield. And so we say, why have I found favor in the eyes of God? Well, you know, the Scripture says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you have been saved through your faith. Your faith attracted God, and that grace came into your life. And he says, you didn't save yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not a result of works, lest anyone boast. So we didn't get saved by being good enough. That's for darn sure. We didn't get saved by working hard enough as far as doing good deeds or giving money or serving people. No, it was simply faith in Jesus attracted the grace of God. And we found favor, just like Ruth finds favor in Boaz, we find favor with God. And Boaz says this to Ruth. He says, it's been reported to me In other words, I've been talking and I've been finding out, because everybody knows everybody's business here. Agricultural communities, strong-knit families, everybody's talking. And, 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 you know, this isn't necessarily gossip. You know, gossip is when you're maliciously trying to tear somebody down. But everybody talks about everybody. You know what what I do as as a pastor and as an employer? When I hire somebody, I give them permission to gossip about me. I don't want them to do it and then feel all bad about it. I tell them, hey, you're having a bad day with me? Then talk to Diana. Talk to Brian. Talk to somebody else. I don't care. I, you know, we got to get off our whole high horse. Sometimes people need to vent, you know, like, well, I don't know why Pastor did that. Because I'm a jerk, you know, and, and because I'm the pastor. Then I can be a jerk and get away with it. I mean, right, that's just life. So I, sometimes people need to vent, and, and I give them that permission to do that. He says, it's been reported to me, and, and Boaz kind of treats Ruth at, uh, as, a new, uh, um, as a new convert. Because she's taken a shadow under the wings of God. She's come into his protection. She's trusting the God of Israel. And he recognizes, listen, she's left her associates. She's left her former lifestyle. She's come in among strangers. She's low in her own eyes and her own estimation. She's found protection under the wings of God. And Boaz sees her faith. Now this is how he sees her faith. Don't miss this point. He sees her faith, not because she's in church like this or in synagogue. Like, <laughs> she sees, he sees her faith in the fact that she loves her mother-in-law so much that she's busting her keisters in the field to provide for her. No rewards, no accolades. She's doing what needs to be done. See, the Bible says there's faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. You know why? Because your faith can fail you. As a matter of fact, Jesus told Peter, Satan wants to sift your faith like wheat, man. You're going to be in for a storm. And we know that our faith can fail us. We have faith in what we would like God to do for us, and sometimes it fails. Our hope can fail us. We get all our hopes up, and we're hoping something that can fail. But something that never fails, the Bible says love never fails. Because when you make the choice to love someone else and to do for someone else, that attracts the attention of God. That love never fails. The problem is, is we're so busy, we're so needy that we want, we want, we want, we want, rather than, hey, I've got something to give. There's somebody in this world that I can love. Maybe it's a single parent kid in the church that you can get eyeball to eyeball with and take them under your wing. Maybe it's somebody that's hurting and you can just befriend them and take them under. Love never fails. And this is what Naomi was doing. The Bible says faith works by love. And he was seeing her love and saying, this is a woman of faith. This is a woman of faith. How much more should we do the same thing that we should be out there uh, uh, doing? You know what? This is a great illustration for older Christians to treat people like Boaz is treating Ruth. Look at verse 14. 
At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. When she arose to glean, Boaz commanded his servant, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. Do not insult her. Also, you shall purposely put out uh, for her some grain from the bundles and leave it that she may glean it and do not rebuke her. Man, all of a sudden, he's really starting to show her some compassion and some favor. And, and, and something might be happening here. Um, so look what he says. He says, dip your bread in the vinegar. And he serves her. She's not even one of the workers. She's just a poor peasant that's coming to the field to pick up a couple of pieces of grain or barley or, <laughs> or wheat or whatever it might have been. And so all of a sudden, we're starting to see a first hint of possible romance. Right? I mean, like, he's noticing this girl and his foreman's telling, you know, like, wow, what a woman of honor. You know, here she is a foreigner and she's like really working hard for him. And, and he's checking her out and she's younger and her name is Beauty candy bar and you know the whole nine yards and and and, and all you know and, and and you know so now and he's giving her all the and i can just see she's flashing her eye you know oh, boo ass you know and all of a sudden like thump, <laughs> right and all of a sudden it's like thump 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 thum, and he's like hey you know what at lunchtime why don't you come over here and i'm gonna serve you and you can dip that was a huge privilege to be able to dip your bread and somebody else's sop of vinegar. Remember the Last Supper? Remember the Passover meal with Jesus? What are they doing? They're dipping together, and they say, Jesus, who is it going to betray you? And he says, the one who dips his sop with me, and Judas does that. And that was a giveaway. That was a trigger. But that was like a real big invitation to come and do that. And this is exactly what he's doing for, um, for, uh, for Ruth at this time. And it says that... Um, it says that she was satisfied. Now listen, one of the things we're going to see in biblical typology is that there's always the face value of what we're studying, what we're reading. This is a story of Elimelech and Naomi and Ruth and Boaz and blah, blah, blah. But then you have the prophetic element and the revelation element that comes into this and the typology, and we're going to see that Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. And when we come to Christ, He totally satisfies us. God satisfies our intellect with the truth of His Word. Right? I mean, you can dig as deep as you want in this thing and you'll never touch bottom. And, and it's, you know, there, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing how there's some people... My brother was telling me he ran into a guy that says, I absolutely don't believe that it's possible for God to exist. There is no God. It's impossible for God to exist. But you know what he believes? He believes in aliens. And so this other guy was talking to him. He says, okay, wait a minute, time out. I got a couple questions. If there are aliens, and they come from a far galaxy, how can they be so mind-melding and so advanced and so smart that they can create spacecrafts that will go into wormholes and travel time warps because galaxies are billions of light years apart? How can they span that time and come into our galaxy to planet Earth and then they don't even know how to speak English? They don't know, like, click, 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 you know what I mean? Like, come on, like you just did all that and you don't even know our language? Right? Why would they come all this way with their advanced technology and burn little circles and crops? Like, ooh, ooh, ooh gotcha. You know? Right? And dear God, why if they could speak English would they say, take me to your leader? No! You don't want to know our leader right now. Seriously. You're like, you just come all this way, you don't know our leader lives in Washington? What's wrong with you? you know, you're supposed to be advanced, right? This is Crazy, crazy stuff. Her, so, so, so Jesus satisfies our mind with the knowledge of the Word of God. He satisfies your heart with His very presence that is sweeter than honey. He satisfies your hope with the eternal belief of heaven and eternal life. He satisfies your desires with an acceptance and a love for you that just absolutely blows us away. In verse 15, it says, She arose. And he said, let her gleam even among 
the sheaths. Again, I want to remind you, she is not a worker. She's a peasant. She's a poor person that's coming to get in on the welfare system of ancient Israel. And he's saying, hey, you know what? Forget about the corners. Forget about the stuff you drop on the ground. Let her come right in with you on the sheaths and let her just take what she needs. This is, this is phenomenal. This, this wasn't allowed. But he's showing incredible favor. And so now Ruth goes and reports what's going on to Naomi. Look at verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening. She beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. So she took it and went into the city to her mother-in-law, and, and when her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, she also took it out and gave Naomi uh, what she had left from when she was satisfied. So the lunch that she had with Boaz, she saved some to bring back to Naomi. And she comes back with an ephah of barley. Now listen, an ephah is like a full bushel. It would have weighed like 60 pounds. She comes home with 60 pounds of wheat or barley, whatever it was that they were harvesting at the time. That's like, dude, groceries. That's like, that's like a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff. You know, 60 pounds is like, you know, hey, I thought you were going to come home with like a pound, maybe a pound and a half. 60 pounds? All of a sudden, man, they're starting to get a clue on what's going on. Now, here's the deal. She loves and she works hard and you know what the Scripture says? The Scripture says this, Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, for by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Ruth is measuring out her love. She's measuring out her work ethic. And she goes home with 60 pounds of stuff. That's good stuff. She gleaned in the field until evening. She worked hard from sunup till sundown. Listen, Blessings follow hard work. I know in the ministry, pastors have a little saying. It's 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. It's a lot, a lot of work. You've got to be able to work. You were created to work. And work is good. Yes, it's cursed and it's difficult, but work is a blessing. No, the weekend's a blessing. <laughs> no, work's a blessing. Look at verse 19. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today and where did you work? May he who took notice on you be blessed. She told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man who I worked, today, worked for today was Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, this man is a relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, furthermore, he said to me, you shall stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you, do, that you go out with his maids so that others do not fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to gleam until the end of barley harvest and the end of wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law, so there's some time going on. And you know that these, these uh, exchanges of, of meeting with Boaz and Ruth are happening probably more and more frequent as these things go on. And all of a sudden, look at Naomi. Naomi all of a sudden starts praising God for his goodness. Now we're starting to see a turnaround from chapter 1. Chapter 1, there was crisis, there was calamity, there was famine, there was death. And she's like, God is really bitter at me. The hand of God's going out. And now all of a sudden, we're starting to see a turnaround where she's praising God, who's not forsaken his kindness towards her. This is the same woman that said, don't call me Naomi, which is pleasant, or, or call me Mara, bitter. Ah. Eat worms. The Almighty's dealt bad with me. Here's the thing. Everything in life is cyclical. Everything in life is seasons. You need to understand that. Everything in life, if you're on the top of the mountain, hey, rejoice and have a great time. It's a season. If you're in the valley, it's a season. Everything is, you know what they say? Some days you're the pigeon, and some days you're the statue. Yeah. Everything is seasons. 
Friday, I hop on my motorcycle. I go down to Liar's Paradise to get my coffee, and I, I go in a little secret place, and I drink my, and I go to Liar's Paradise, and I start making my coffee, and it was like, oh my goodness, you know, the cups fumble around, and I pick up the cup, and the coffee sprays, and, and you know, and, and then the cream are like, well, yeah, and then I drop the lid, and the girl behind the counter, she goes, oh my goodness, you're having a Monday. I'd never heard that before, but it's like, you're, I'm having a Monday on Friday. Everything's going bad. But you know what? That's seasonal. Everything in life is seasonal. And that's what's happening here. But now, all of a sudden, Mara is turning back to Naomi, and she's seeing God's plan beginning to unfold. Yes, it was horrible what happened in chapter 1, but now things are turning around, and she's starting to praise God. She's starting to worship God. Listen to me. If I could only crack your head open this morning and take your brain and inject it with the power of worshiping God, that you would learn to taste and see that God is good, that you would learn to not be there like this singing the songs, you know, forever God is faithful, but get into it. Lift holy hands, the Bible says. Clap your hands, the Bible says. Shout unto God with a voice of make worship exciting and meaningful. And if you would all dial it up and ramp it up a little bit, I wish you could understand the power. Because God does things in worship. Worship is profoundly powerful. That's why we spend so much. Listen, we could open up, sing a hymn, have a poem, re- you know, have a reading, and then just get into the Word. Why does Assemblies of God put so much emphasis on singing songs and worshiping God? Because it is profoundly important in your life. You're created to worship and bless God. And when you do that to offer up a sacrifice of praise, God reciprocates in your life and does things in your life and pours out blessings in your life. Oh, I wish I could get, you know, sometimes I tell people, hey, I want to tell you about Moxie Nogs. And you're like, what? Oh, yeah, it's a little drink that I experimented with. Half Moxie and half eggnog. And everyone's like that. They're like, but you know what? I've never had a person yet that's tasted it and said, hey, you know what? That's pretty darn good. That's really, I, I'm, you know, if I, could, if I could sell it to the world, I'd market it, I'd probably become a millionaire. Moxinogs, awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. But see, i got to get you to try it. I wish I could get you to try really worshiping God from the depths of your heart and with all of your being and all your emotion because I'm telling you what, man, God has done bigger things in my life during times of worship than He has around times of the altar. Phew. Man, that's good stuff. Ruth says, stay with this man, Boaz. Not only is he generous, but he's a relative. He is a kinsman. And what we're going to see is that he is a kinsman redeemer. And so we're going to see how this all ties in in the up and coming chapters. And Naomi begins to think like, you know, wow, God's really, God's already hatching a plan. God is already in the middle of this. You see, it was God that ended the famine. It was God that brought Ruth and Naomi together and bound their hearts together. It was God that had Boaz in the wings just waiting for this whole rendezvous. It was God who brought Ruth supernaturally into Boaz's fields like And all of a sudden, he's a kinsman. They never knew that. Good things happen to people who take refuge under the wings of God. So, in closing, here it is. Number one, what's your main takeaway? Please don't say it was the alien part. (laughs) What's your main takeaway? And how can you apply that takeaway to your life? Just think about that a moment. What was, it, what was your main takeaway from this message? How can you apply that in your life? Secondly, what would it look like for you to take even greater refuge under the wings of God? What does that look like for you? Ruth is taking refuge under the wings of God. What does it look like for you to do that in a very specific manner? And number three, When you're so low and life is so hard, look up. Because there is a God that is working things out. He is working His plans, His purposes, and you're a part of that. You're included in that. The book of Acts never ended. 
You know, the book of Acts is the story of the early church. That's never ended. That's still being written today, and your name is in the book of Acts. The other day, I went kayaking. We bought a couple kayaks. I didn't go with Darlene because she wipes out all the time. Is she here? She went out kayaking with, Jeanette, uh, with uh, Dana the other day. She went out kayaking, we took, took Dana out kayaking. And she's in, she's in Fundy Cove in Pawtuckaway, and there's like these big brushy islands, and you can kind of go through them. And she's like going through them, and all of a sudden this snake comes out of the bush and lands right in her kayak. Shoot. And she sucked in a great big gulp of pond water, and that gave her pond fever, if you know what I mean. So, um, so anyways, don't tell her I said that. All right? Come on, I'm trusting you now. But, but anyways, listen, listen, listen. So, out, so last night, um, I, I just went out kayaking by myself. She was really tired, so I went kayaking. I'm in Fundy Cove, and I'm just like floating around the lily pads. And I noticed something I've never noticed before. You know, lily pads, the big things that they float to the surface and, and they just spread out and soak up the sun. I noticed that there's some lily pads that are still like 10, 11, 12 inches underwater. You might feel like you're underwater this morning. You might feel like you're just drowning a little bit, like you're not where you need to be. But you know those lily pads have still unfolded themselves horizontally to the sun And they can still photosynthesize and do what they need to do through 12 inches of water. Even though you might feel like you're underwater this morning, the power of the presence of Jesus still goes through that water and still touches your life and can still heal your life and bring peace to your life and bring purpose to your life. So even though you feel like you're drowning, even though you feel like you're underwater, God is a good God. And when life doesn't make sense, listen, it does when you look at Jesus. And when you can have that blind trust to say, it doesn't make sense for me right now, but I know that one day I'll understand. I know that one day I'll see everything in the light of your perfect plan and in eternity where you even took my faults and my failures and you brought beauty out of the ashes, because God is good. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful again for the revelation that comes to us from the Word of God. And as we read this book of Ruth and just see the profound stories that are in the Scriptures, we glean so much out of it, God. We, We truly harvest uh, things and, and those things satisfy us, those things satiate us, those things nourish us. And so this morning, Lord, I do pray for that one that might feel like they're underwater and that they're drowning. I pray, God, that they would open themselves up to the light of your presence, even though there's things that seem to be blocking that, there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. And I pray that you richly touch and bless each one here this morning. In your great name we pray. And everyone said, amen and amen and amen. Hey, greet somebody again as you're leaving. Remember our fellowship hour out here. We have some refreshments. Stick around and enjoy that.